In this video, we're going to show you four meals that you can easily cook after a disaster. We're going to use simple techniques to help you conserve your fuel, reduce cleanup, conserve water, which may be precious, and maximize nutrition, leaving you with a satisfied, full feeling. We'll also assume your home's utilities may have been cut, so we'll utilize practical and proven cooking. We'll also provide a link to the ingredients and cooking instructions that we're going to use in this video. So let's jump in. No boil pasta. You don't need a boiled pasta, but you do need boiling water. For boiling water, we can use something like a simple camp stove with a propane tank or an induction plate connected to either a gas or a solar generator. It's important to understand that pasta does not cook because of the boiling water. It cooks because of the temperature of the boiling water. So if you bring your water to a boil, just add a pinch of salt to help maintain temperature, add your pasta, stir it, and put a lid on the pot. You can now turn off your heat source, thus conserving the fuel. The pasta will be softened and ready to eat in about 12 to 14 minutes. This is valuable information if you're trying to conserve cooking fuel or minimize outdoor open fires. Also, when cooking pasta, scoop the pasta out, but don't dump the water. The water can be used as a thickener for cooking because of its flour content. Wheat flour is 70 to 75% starch, so some of that separates out in the water. You can reuse all the pasta water as a base for soup or stew. Simply drop a bouillon cube in the water for a rich broth to sip throughout the day and night. Once cooled, you can drink it as a carbohydrate-rich energy drink. Mixing in the appropriate amount of powdered milk or drink mix will give it back a richness that is sometimes lost in the dehydration, powdering, and packaging process. Pasta con carne and white sauce. Bring a pot of water to a boil. Add between a teaspoon of salt or one three-finger pinch. Add two ounces of dry pasta per plan plate served. Stir pasta with a few swirls. Turn off the heat source and place the lid securely on top. It will now be done in about 12 to 14 minutes. In a medium bowl, combine two cups dry milk powder, one cup flour, one teaspoon salt, one eight teaspoon pepper, one teaspoon garlic powder, and one stick butter. Or if you don't have butter, you can use butter powder, which is shelf stable. Mix together with a fork until thoroughly combined. If you time this right, you will add the pasta to your mix or you can scoop the pasta out and gently stir in a tablespoon of oil to keep it from sticking together. In a separate pan, warm four cups of water. You can use the already warm pasta water if your pasta is done cooking. With the warm water, turn up the heat source on the pan and slowly mix in your bowl of drier ingredients. Stir to prevent lumping. When smoothly and slightly steaming, add seasoning to taste in any herbs dried or foraged. The best herbs for this meal are basil, dill, or parsley. The herbs will freshen up the taste. Finally, add one or two cans of canned meat with any of the canned liquid. Bring this to a strong simmer, then turn off the heat source and add it to your cooked but strained pasta. Gently stir and serve. The type of meat or additional additives will determine your end product. You have lots of latitude here. Add canned tuna and you just made a tuna with bechamel sauce, canned chicken, a chicken alfredo, canned clams, and it is a pasta and white clam sauce. What we have created with this recipe is a basic white sauce. If you add dried parmesan, it leans toward an alfredo sauce. Your white canned meats are going to be better in this sauce. Consider changing your herbs to more savory like sage or rosemary and beef bouillon to your warm water before you mix in your dry ingredients. Perpetual Stew, Hunter's Pot, Forever Soup, Stone Soup. It has been a common practice at least as far back as medieval times and likely even longer to have a pot of stew continually cooking. Your ancient ancestors survived on this. Pasteurization occurs if you keep the temperature above 145 degrees with the lid on for 30 minutes or more. If you can use a can cooker or a Dutch oven and keep that wrapped in blankets or a wonder bag to slow the heat loss, you can easily store the food overnight and heat it up again in the morning with no health risk, so long as it stays above or relatively near while sealed at that temperature point. If you have a campfire, you can simply set the pot in the proximity of the radiant heat of the fire in an area where you can hold your hand comfortably for about 10 seconds. Generally, when you can only hold your hand for a count of 6 to 8 seconds, the temperature is between 250 and 300 degrees. Add 1 tablespoon of oil to a Dutch oven or a standard cooking pot with a lid. When the oil is heated, add 1 fourth cup of dried minced onions, fresh green onions, or a bulb onion. Add a cube of beef bouillon, canned meat such as roast beef along with the juices, or fresh meat, whatever you have. Once the meat is brown, add 2 or 3 canned vegetables or fresh vegetables or dehydrated vegetables that you have stored away. Green beans, corn, potatoes, carrots, mushrooms, or whatever else you enjoy eating. Anything goes here with the vegetables. The only consideration is that some vegetables over time will completely cook down and thicken your stew like potatoes and carrots. The solution is just to add more water at the start of the day. 
Add four to six cups water, bring the Dutch oven or pot to a near boil, or add it to something like a wonder bag to trap the heat and allow it to continue cooking. Or there are options on the market such as a can cooker, which will allow you to get it to a boiling temperature, then turn off the heat source and let it retain heat and cook. This minimizes fuel use and the scent of cooking food, attracting unwanted guests. You can transfer the entire contents of the pot to a thermal cooking container once it has been brought to a cooking temperature and allow it to cook for four to five hours slowly. Again, the advantage here is that we save fuel in the process. I cover 12 ways to safely cook after a disaster, which explores all these devices and methods in another video. I'll link to that in the description and comments section below. I can add more water and seasonings and ingredients the next morning and bring it back up to cooking temperature in a pot, put it in a thermal cooker or in your bag or next to an open flame and repeat the process. Now, if you add chunks of raw meat, you must go through the whole cooking process to ensure that the meat reaches an internal temperature of at least 165 degrees. 45 minutes on medium heat will accomplish this. Each day, you must add new vegetables as these will cook down and thicken your stew. Over time, the flavors of your stew will gradually change, but you will have a consistent warm food source. Beans, uncooked, cooked, or canned. Canned beans are the easiest to work with because they're pre-softened. The canning process pasteurizes and pre-cooks them. Now don't throw out the liquid. It contains salt and carbohydrates that your body will need in a post-disaster environment. Consider diluting it into water and adding some powder drink mix. This will give you the salts, electrolytes, and carbs to keep you going. If you start with dried beans, you must soak them in water and a pinch of salt or a tablespoon of vinegar for at least 12 hours. Now you can skip this and just boil them until soft, but that will take more water and cooking time and you will lose the shape of some of the beans. Since you can just boil these to make them edible and add seasoning, we will take this a step further and use bean flour. To make bean flour, you simply have to pulverize it down to a powder with the dried beans of your choice. You can do this the old fashioned way with a mortar and pestle. Because you want a powder with a small granular flour-like consistency, I use my backup battery in a blender. You don't have to wait until after disaster before making flour. Bean flour brownies. Mix the dry ingredients in a large bowl. One three-fourths cup bean flour, one half cup cocoa powder, three-fourths cup sugar, and a teaspoon of baking powder. You'll need to add an egg binder to this. If you have eggs, you will add three whole eggs. You can add the equivalent of three eggs and rehydrate whole egg powder. If you have no eggs, there are many egg substitutes, but many will give you a different texture in your browning. For instance, you could use one tablespoon of ground flax seed and two and one half tablespoons of water. To this, you can add just a pinch of powdered milk to give it a little bit more richness. I'm gonna use rehydrated whole egg powder because that's what's in my prepper pantry for after a disaster. Add two tablespoons vanilla extract, two tablespoons oil, ghee, or butter. Add one fourth cup water. Mix all to a pourable but thick consistency. Pour it into an oil or grease 9x9 pan. If you have an oven, you would place this in there for 325 degrees for 20 minutes. If you only have a campfire, you can place foil over the top and place it on some heated rocks about 8 inches from the fire. Rotate the pan by a fourth every 5 minutes. I'm going to use my solar oven. It will take me about 30-40 to 40 minutes with this method. You'll know when it is done with any of the methods when a toothpick can be inserted in the center and it comes out clean. If it has a batter on it when you pull it out, cook it longer. Variations of this could include peanut butter powder, nuts, chopped mint leaves, or chocolate chips. Savory Rice Pancakes Rice has been found in archaeological sites dating to 8000 BC, so humans have some experience cooking and eating it. Rice is a grain belonging to the grass family and is consumed by nearly one half of the entire world's population. Now, you may only be familiar with boiled rice. You may also want to be aware of white and brown rice, though there are different varieties. White rice is preferred for long-term storage because it lacks the husk, which contains natural oils that can oxidize and cause spoilage. Here are some things you might not know about rice. Like beans, they can be ground in the flour and used in baking. It lacks the glutens of wheat, and glutens are what hold the food together in many cases. Now, Because of this, many recipes will require an egg or a binding agent to be added to get the correct consistency. Rice and beans together form a complete high-fiber vegetarian protein. The amino acids of each complement the other to create a complete protein. That is to say, it has all the essential amino acids the body requires. If you want to add beans to rice, cook them separately, then add them together as they cook at different speeds. I'm going to assume that you know how to cook rice, so I'll take it a little step further here and make rice pancakes. If you want to make pancakes similar to what you might have at a breakfast restaurant, there are recipes for that which use rice flour. Ours is more of a savory pancake that uses day-old rice and will taste much like fried rice. Leftover rice dries out a bit and makes it better to develop a bit of a crunch. 
This recipe will add some type of alium, like green onion, chives, wild onion, or ramps, depending on what you have, to make it kind of a Korean version of what is called panjang. It's savory and can be snacked on throughout the day. You could add some chopped spinach, kale, dandelion, or broadleaf plantain for a less savory but just as flavorful version. I'm going to create a one egg version of this, and you can scale up depending on how many eggs you have. Double the ingredients for two eggs, triple them for three, and so on. Take one and one half cups rice and give it a few chops on the cutting board. You don't want to reduce it into a paste, but it will come together and cook better if the grains are at least half in size. Add one half cup chopped allium or other green. Add one four teaspoon of pepper or chili flakes. Add a pinch of salt. Add one egg or the equivalent egg substitute. When mixed, scoop about one fourth cup onto a hot skillet with about a tablespoon of cooking oil on it and mash the mix down to a level of one fourth inch thickness. After a few minutes, the bottom will begin to brown and the eggs will firm up the pancake. When it is flippable, do so. Give it an equivalent amount of time on the other side. Remove from heat and let it cool a bit while you're cooking the next one. As it cools, it will release more moisture and firm up even further. This will make about six small pancakes. These are very tasty and can be cooked on an open campfire or any griddle or a cast iron pan. It's the simplicity and versatility of this savory rice pancake that makes it a winner. For a breakfast version of this, leave out the savory ingredients and try adding a pinch or two of cinnamon or nutmeg and a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Cooking Methods In this video I've demonstrated thermal cooking because it's one of your best go-to options after a disaster. All you need is a heat source and a means to retain the heat as long as possible. Now one advantage of cooking this method is that it contains much of the smells and minimizes the open flame period. From a security standpoint, this makes it less likely that anyone will come around looking to eat your meal. With proper ventilation, you can accomplish thermal cooking with a small propane or butane camping stove indoors, a natural gas burning stove if the use of natural gas is safe and is still flowing, a barbecue grill, open fire, or a solar oven. You could even use a hot plate if you have some type of backup power. The key is raising the temperature and then retaining the heat. For safety reasons, if you do cook with an open flame of any kind indoors, make sure you have a working carbon monoxide alarm and a means to extinguish a fire. If you'd like printable copies of these recipes, we will be posting them individually at cityprepping.com. If you'd like to see more recipes cooked in non-traditional ways, like this video and leave a comment or suggestion below. Knowing how to cook after a disaster can mean the difference between dying or thriving. In the aftermath of a disaster, you won't last long if you're forced to crunch on dried beans or rice to survive. Approach cooking like any of your preps and have a few recipes for food that you can bring to the table. You'll be glad you took the time now. As always, stay safe out there.